So we're here, we've done a, a kind of good enough tuning to hear the voicing, and I, I didn't go crazy on the tuning, but um, it should be clean enough for us, for our purposes. So obviously now the piano's really plenty punchy, a little bit quirky, and uneven, right? Kind of some jangling sound in there. Stuff like that that kind of just is distracting right from the scales and so I'm gonna start this is the paintbrush this is my voicing needle it's just a needle and a brass holder that's skinny enough to fit through the strings and I also prior to this I did do some voicing on the shift and I'll okay. show that. It's just several needles. One of them's broken on the end, but it oh, still works. Oh, that's okay. Let me get that in focus. That should be close enough. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, where I marked the strings when we shift, then I went over those areas with this needle. And you can be more aggressive or less. The more aggressive you are, the more mellow and more contrast you're going to have when you shift. But so I kind of did that already across the piano as a wholesale thing. But now I want to beautify the tone. I want to make this piano just really feel like a unified instrument, registers balanced and all that, like you have a lot of control over the dynamics. Sure. So <clears throat> this is the part that we spent so long strengthening. I don't think I want to start here. <laughs> yeah. I want to get my chops under me a little bit, and I'm going to start just in, in an obviously objectionable area of the piano, where I know, OK, we need to come down. Middle C, that's a great place to start. Okay. So C4. So it sounds like I'm hitting it harder, but I'm not. It's just uneven. So I'm going to put the hammer in check, and I'm going to scoot the hammer down here, and I'm going to go right in the center, in this case, of the grooves. Already a little bit of a change. Okay. I'll keep going here in the middle groove and the left. My lights, our light battery is going to cut out on us here. So it took some of the brightness out of it, the pinginess. Sure. Can you explain what, what you mean by putting it in check and then easing off the, the hammer? Because I found that to be really uh, fascinating. I actually learned how to do this a little, a little bit on my own. Yeah. When, again, I'm not going through and voicing my entire piano, but if a note gets kind of gross, I will then just kind of voice it down a little bit and it seems to really help. Yeah, yeah, that's a common thing. I think most people, most pianists would have a better time kind of touching up the voicing on your piano rather than touching up the tuning, you know, in terms yeah. of skill level required. So I'm going to, we talked about putting the hammer in check here. When I play it off the strings, it's going to catch on this catch. If I don't let it catch in the back there on the back check, uh -huh. the reason I, I do that is because if, I, if it's not in check, and I'm pushing, it doesn't, like, on, it's hard to, you know, it bounces up and it doesn't stay. Oh, okay. I need something to hold it still while I'm poking in and, and, and while I'm pulling it out so that it doesn't just float around on me. So can you do that with, like, one finger in your left hand so we can really see, like, uh, when you play the, the key? You play the key? Yeah. So, like, to kind of show us how you do that. Because this is not, okay, perfect. But as long as you're playing, you know, mezzo piano and up. Uh-huh. In dynamics, it should go into check, and uh, you get in here, and then I can push it down here. And as you push it down, do you consciously lift your left finger up? Just or? a little bit, just enough to let it go down. Okay. And then we're resting. Then I'm using this cushion as a brace to push against. Okay. Perfect. So. so. This is such a useful skill. That's just why I wanted to clarify all this. Yes, yeah, so you do have to let up on your left. Let up on your left hand as you're sinking into the hammer a little bit. Okay. Let it sink down. I, I don't want to affect the voicing. I'll use the blunt end of the <laughs> needle here. Let it come down. Um, and then my right now the key's all the way up. Uh -huh. At that point when I'm pushing down, and then I can pu push the key. Then I can pull the needle out and look. The hammer doesn't come back up. With a little bit of pressure on the key, I'm keeping it. Oh, interesting. In place. So it's just there's just more control there. Okay, cool. If it's flopping all over the place, you're likely to break a needle, tweak the hammer, or something bad. 
Okay, perfect. And it's a lot slower. I mean, when you are voicing an entire piano, how many strings do we have? You know, 280 some odd strings. Yeah. Plus, um, there's a lot of needle pokes. You gotta move. You gotta move if you want to get it done today. You know. Yeah. So. And this is an obvious thing that we haven't touched on. Why do you have to put those cheek blocks back in every single time you do anything? We went through the painstaking effort of setting that strike point. I want to hear what it's going to sound like. And in fact, now you bring it up. I actually, with this new Hamburg cheek block that's in here, I want to cinch it down so that it doesn't move. Okay. Because I might be shifting the piano also as we do this. Yeah, so cinching it down. And I always, you probably notice when I tighten this screw, I habitually, um, let me make sure I'm not in the slot here. I habitually knock on this to make sure it's not floating like we talked about. Sure. That's why I'm not, that's why I'm knocking. It's not for good luck. <laughs> and locking down both sides is key to getting that key truly bedded. Is that the right terminology? To get it in the same position where we had it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that, cause, cause when you, the shift lever is about under here. Okay. So when it pulls on the action, the action wants to go like this. Oh, okay. So we're just, we're making sure it's in the position it's going to be when the player plays it. Because it really does matter. I poke, I'm poking specific hard spots in the hammer that are responsible for the tones that are objectionable. Sure. So if I, you know, I could, I could go just a little bit to the left, right, forward, or back and miss that and not make a change. Yeah. So at least the change that I want. Okay, that C's more in line. Sure. I'm not saying we're done with it, but you don't want to just pick and pick at it or you'll go too far. Sure. This one's not too bright to me, but it's strong. Yeah. So what's the fix? The same exact thing to the bright one. Okay. <laughs> so just poking in this it a case, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna start in the center of these anyway. I maybe went a little deeper. Okay. Now the D sticks out to me as being a little bright. Do you ever poke one uh, groove and then stop and say, oh, that's enough? Or do you want to be uniform with it and poke all three if you're going to poke anything? I've had pianists say to me, why don't you just poke one? Especially like right before a concert, they were worried I was going to go too far. They were having me even something out. Um, the reason I want to poke all three, uh -huh. one is more of just like a token poke, even if the felt is soft. On, like usually the left string will be softest. Okay. Because we've needled shift voicing, doing a quarter voicing around it, and the middle one's soft, and then the right one's usually the hard one. Okay. But if I just poke the right one, I plunge into the felt, I lift, it raises the felt and puffs it up in that area. And we went through all that effort of mating the strings to the hammers. I don't want to undo that. Yeah. So that's why I'm poking all three. But yes, sometimes I'll just poke one or two anyway, but I'm just try I try and be careful not to puff up the felt. Yeah. Here I'm isolating with my fingers, just muting the outsides, listening to the middle string. It's kind of a muted, dull sound in uh -huh. the middle. The right one, a little, more a little too alive. Yeah. And the left one's a little muted too. Okay. So. So yeah, like I said, it's, it's usually the right side because we haven't had needling and, and it just, I don't know, it's just the way we align the hammers, there's, there's a little more hardness there. There. See, the, when I said we weren't done with the C, it kind of came up again a little bit. Yeah. It's a little hot again. So voicing, you have to do it in layer, layers. And talk to us just for a second about uh, needling depth. Obviously, if you barely touch it, it won't do anything. If you shove it way down in, is that going to completely deaden it? Or is how far in are we talking? Yeah, so the, the, the amount of felt between the very top of the hammer and when you would hit that wood molding that's in the middle of uh -huh. the hammer. Yeah. The base, there's quite a lot of felt on top of that wood molding, right? Yeah. And that, that thickness thins out. So where I'm going with that, Josh, is that in the treble, you don't want to go as deep. You don't need to go as deep. Okay. In the bass, you have to do more pokes that are deeper to get the same amount of change as you would up here with a much shallower part. Sure. Also, the way I think of it 
and, and this isn't the whole story, but the deeper I poke, I'm going to be affecting my louder dynamics more. Okay. So the shallower, I'm just creating a soft kind of a shelter for our softer dynamics. And if I, but if the problem is, if, if, it's, if it's got that softness to it, but the problem is it's way too strong when you increase your dynamic level, then I would go and needle again, I would just needle a little deeper. And that'll obviously affect the soft stuff too, but not to the same extent. Yeah, and it's already kind of affected. It's almost like I'm kind of using the same hole, just going a little sure. further. And someone who would be scared to do this, maybe talk through the fact that pianos re-break in their, <laughs> uh, you know, like that it'll get bright again, you mean? Yeah, exactly. It's not like the end of the world. Like I, when I first learned this, I got a little excited and I overneedled something and I was like, oh no, I ruined it. And then after, you know, a couple weeks of banging on it, it came right back. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, especially if you do it in a certain way, you know, I'm, I'm poking right in the middle of the strike point of that hammer but I know from experience that, that for me that's the safest place. And some technicians here never touch the very top. Uh -huh. They're really concerned about that. But with these New York hammers and the way I voice them, I do them a lot. It works pretty well. It's, it won't kill the note going there. And then I'll go, if anything, a little bit towards me a little bit to voice the louder dynamics. What would needling the back of the hammer do? Does that kill it more? It, it, it affects more to me the attack a little bit of it. So if you want a softer like attack, so it feels like it's kind of coming out of nowhere, uh -huh. then you might want to look and see if there's a hard spot there. Okay. But I, what, I'll tell you honestly why I stray away from that area of the piano is I, I thought it was just magical to voice on that side because it created this kind of neat like glow to the piano. And I thought it was great. And then I had a pianist come in the store actually and try it. And they said, well, whatever you did, don't do that again. <laughs> they thought it was just like, you know, too muted, too, sure. too stuffy. So I don't poke there a lot unless I'm really darn sure that it's going to, you know, there's a certain quality of sound that I've, I'm accustomed to that if I poke it there, that, that it's going to give me the desired result. But sure. it's hard to describe. Yeah, voicing is not, I mean, the overall evenness that we're going to create, yes, that'll, that'll stay in the instrument, you know, in yeah. general, but you're going to have some notes that pop up hot, especially if you're practicing a piece all the time and you're playing a certain note, you know, all the time, right? So. So I'm starting in an area of the piano that I know is naturally, it has a lot of sustain, a lot of, a lot of, tone to it. Right. It's pretty safe to voice in the middle. Everyone's going to play here a lot. Um, it's a safe place to start. Sure. Especially middle C. <laughs> so here I'm back on middle C again and I and I kind of probe Josh when I when I put that hammer in check and I've got it pushed down, I kind of feel around up and down up and down and I'm I can I'm feeling the relative hardness of that hammer along that string groove deciding where I want to thrust and I pick the hardest spot generally okay. and thrust there. I, I like the tone of that C now, it's getting kind of nice, you know? Yeah. It is, in my opinion, unrealistic to say, here's this note, I absolutely love the tone quality of this note. I want all the notes to sound that way. It doesn't quite work that way. Right. Even if you want it to. <laughs> <laughs> and plus the different sections of the piano, they, they, they're different. They have to be voiced a little bit differently to speak out and to be balanced musically, I feel like. So. Sure.
I don't know. I don't know if anyone's wondering. Well, if you're gonna poke all three anyway, why do you bother listening? I still want to know what's going on, and I want to know where to focus my attention. Like if I want to plunge deeper on the one that's the offending string. Short. And I'm trying to achieve um, what I think, Josh, you talked about how you like some qualities of the New York, you know, or, or probably any piano when it, when you can get that, what do we call it, the velvety kind of sound? Yeah. I want to be able to have that, your softest dynamics like that F, but still be able to have it to snap clear, you know, when you want it to with relatively little effort. I don't want the note to say, this is the tone I'm going to be no matter what, right. no matter how you hit me, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like this, e, this E flat's kind of rigid like that. Uh huh. It doesn't, doesn't change quality a lot. It doesn't change color a lot in dynamics, just dynamics. Gotcha. So I'm going to soft, I'm gonna, so I'm going to work on the low end of it, make that a little more mellow, and then that'll, that'll allow me to have different colors. Yeah, and I, just to say, I think the fact that Hiram plays the piano well and technicians that play the piano well, I think are much more sensitive to this. I've noticed that those who don't play the piano well have a much harder time voicing, um, yeah. just for whatever reason. It, it, maybe they don't know kind of what you were talking about with the velvety tone or different shades of dynamics. It's not just, oh, this sounds soft, this sounds loud, okay, we're good. It, there's a lot of nuance in here, so. I, I love music, you know, and I love playing the piano ever since I was four, right? So for me to be able to, even if I can't play the repertoire, I can appreciate the musical gesture or the difference in color, and I can pretend like I'm, you know, composing 20th century music, but, you know, and, and do some gesture that's similar to what you're playing in on D, you know, even what. <laughs> yeah. you know, it doesn't make any sense. I can get a real feel for how that piano is going to respond tonally. Perfect. We'll let we'll let you get down to work because I know this is a tedious process, and we'll pick up as soon as you're finished. Sounds good.